it's exciting to see a full crowd represented by Balboa Island. So thank you for taking the trip and t taking a trip um, memory lane tonight with us. And so we have a beautiful program that's going to begin, but um, I want to extend myself to you first off and share a little bit about the museum. Um, I hope each of you have had an opportunity to stop in. Um, by a show of hands, who has been to the Balboa Island Museum? Fantastic. That is excellent. So those of you who are sitting by someone who has not been, look to your neighbor and extend yourself to stop by. We are open six days of the week, Tuesday through Sundays, 10 to 4 p.m., in a delightful 1947 cottage lived in by the Pulaski family. So when you come in, you're going to be entreated to a, a divine story of um, a small town um, that was birthed um, right from a sand pit. And so let us entertain you your family, summer's coming, so we want them to, to see us and um, give them an opportunity to learn the history as we know it. And so um, that does not stop there, right? <laughs> we have a beautiful gift shop. Um, that's what most see walking in um, along Marine. Um, we have a beautiful line of curated goods. Um, we have jewelry and um, art, and um, it goes on on decor, toys. It's just a beautiful experience, so support local, 501c3. We're a nonprofit, so when you buy directly from us, this is what we can do with that kind of purchase. So it, it supports us, and of course, um, as you walked in, people were asking you, um, namely Steve, our membership chair, so everyone, um, we're, we're excited for him to be with us because um, we want you to join our organization. Um, it's a great way for you to get to know your community. Um, it's tax deductible, so how can you say no? <laughs> and it brings you wonderful events um, such as tonight's um, or arrangement. And so um, we have some wonderful things on our calendar. Um, I hope each of you have heard about the Vintage Home Tour, June 17th. Um, it's Father's Day weekend. Invite your father or adopted father to um, see some beautiful homes, a vintage boat, um, the Royal Hen, and the Amelia story. And so it's going to give you an opportunity to glance back and then also make history with us. So put that on your calendar. Tickets are already being sold tonight. So come find me. I would gladly sell you a little package, <laughs> and so go as a group. Um, it's a great way to see um, Babel Island through the homes. Those homes have stories, right? So when you moved in, and maybe the original owner may have passed on some photos and a beautiful story, but that's why we organize these annually, is so we can highlight a group and um, open your eyes to your own neighborhood. So um, many of you have heard from the press about an exciting exhibit that opens this Friday for John Wayne Day. Um, May 26 is his birthday, and so there's citywide events. But for the museum, we are excited. The John Wayne Cancer Foundation has curated a beautiful summer exhibition about his life. So of course, he was the movie star, the glamorous. Um, Marion Morrison once became, you know, a stagehand and then evolved into John Wayne, this fabulous cowboy as we know him. But he was a, a local. He had the wild goose. He had a great story aboard. So let us um, tell you that story as, um, as well. That whole exhibit runs through Labor Day weekend, and we have a line of curated goods along with that. So maybe you need the book and um, entertain your guests while they're in. So um, keep your eyes out if you haven't joined um, our membership. Um, we want you to so you can get those emails um, mail out so you have um, other events that we will be inviting you to. So stop in. If you don't know us yet, become our friend. We'd love to have you. So thank you for being here tonight. Good evening. Uh, it is very exciting to see so many people here. We can... That's Wing's son. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, I am uh, president of the Balboa Island Museum and Historical Society, and uh, you know, we've been in our new location for five years, and uh, you know, for a little museum, we have very big ideas. So, uh, which brings us here tonight, and uh, I wanted to thank Tim Heatherton, who is actually not here tonight, but he's the uh, library uh, director, and then the Newport Beach City Arts uh, Commission, are the ones that made this evening possible, which is great because we could never do this at our museum because of the sp limited space. So I am very excited 
to introduce the, the Lee family, Mr. and Mrs. Lee. Okay. And the, our residents of Balboa Island and founders of the Shanghai Pine Garden Restaurant and others which they will tell you about. Their, their success was their success was building restaurants and their passion is helping others uh, here and in China. Wing Lam is the third of their five sons. He does not need an introduction. He is the co-founder and uh, with two of his brothers of Wahoo's Fish Tacos and the public face of the company, including PR, marketing, and surfing. This is one amazing family with an incredible story, and you'll have the opportunity to hear them talk, and maybe Mr. Lee will even sing for us. So, welcome. Uh, I'll, I'll do most of the talking, because my parents uh, pretty much speak Chinese, Japanese, Portuguese, and Spanish, and about this much English. So I'll do my best to give you the whole story here. So it's kind of like the, the full like a circle of life where after World War II, right, there were basically a couple of choices in China. You either got out or you're going to stay for about 30 to 40 years, right, because it didn't reopen until, what, 1982 again, right? So my dad and a bunch of his buddies got out and basically, you know, and I have to share my buddy Rick there, the guy with the tattoos, it's the, the Chinese version of the wetback because my dad literally swam across the river from mainland China into Hong Kong. But as we all know it, the, the river is literally a little stream. So he literally walked across it. But when my dad tells it, he swam across, right? <laughs> so, uh, and he was, I guess, recently married to my mom and my mom basically stayed behind because she was pregnant. So just to kind of give you that also is there's about a 10 year gap between the time uh, my dad had the first son that he never saw and actually when he met him for the first time in Brazil, okay? So my dad is in Hong Kong and literally without any education, you know, as we call it, labor, he basically learned to cook on a street cart. And in China, like here, we would have like a hot dog cart. But in China, there was actually like a walk at the end of the cart. And you picked up your vegetables along the sides. And then you brought it like you see at a Mongolian barbecue. And that, that's what he would toss in a walk. So that's what he was doing. And at the end of every night, he would take the scraps that were left over, the vegetables, whatever that he didn't use. And there was an elderly gentleman that would always stop by. And that's what he would eat. So after a while, my dad basically said, hey, you know, you're here and I'm, I'm gonna help you. And the gentleman says, you're wasting your talent here because I can see that you're a really good chef. And again, you talk about karma, right? He goes, you don't know who I am, but I used to be a really wealthy businessman in mainland China before the communists you know, took over. So I still have some friends in Japan and I'd like to help you get over there. So here's the guy that's feeding him and if my dad is gone, who's gonna feed him next, right? but he didn't think twice, and off to Japan my father went, right? So he goes over there, and after a few years, he's running five of the best Chinese restaurants in Tokyo, and the owner has a few daughters, and basically offers my dad the deal. He goes, hey, if you marry one of them, this is yours, right? The dowry, right? So my dad goes, well, I like to do that, but I, st I already have a wife in mainland China, and it's been a few years, he hasn't seen her, right? So then again, all of the Japanese and a lot of the Asians, if you know the history about South America, they were going there because of what happened with Pearl Harbor. They were gonna come to America because it wasn't Asian friendly, right? So they, everybody went to South America. So you hear that Brazil has the second largest Japanese population outside of Japan. That's where literally all the farmers in South America and some of the best sushi guys are all from South America. Right? So that's why, again, the little hits of you guys, if you see the little hot peppers on top of your hamachi or whatever, think about it. Japanese food is not spicy other than uh, the horseradish, right? Well, that little serrano pepper comes from Peru. So think about that. And all of a sudden, the crudo, all the stuff that we now see in America has a big South American influence. 
So my dad decided to get on a boat. And part of the story here gets funny because we think about he's coming to America. He gets on a boat that has SS America, which is South America, not America as we know it. So anyway, we, 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 he's joking, but he ends up in Brazil. Same thing again, right? He's there, very successful. And now he's got one of the first Chinese restaurants in Sao Paulo, Brazil, and all his buddies are there. And again, along the way, pretty much all of my father's friends that left mainland China in a 10 year period, when you're in your 20s, think about that, right? You end up meeting people along the way. So they got remarried in Hong Kong, remarried in Tokyo, and remarried in Brazil. So when you hear about multiple wives, a lot of my dad's friends have multiple wives, right? But my dad remained unmarried. So my mom figured out, and that was it, 10 years gone by. It was, if I don't go find your father, I'm never going to see him again, and he's never going to meet his son, right? So my mom basically does the same thing, right? But this, she's a little smarter, right? She can't swim, so she gets in one of those junkies, right? And this is a story that we'll never be able to tell if it's true or not, but this is the version that we got, right? <laughs> that they were hidden underneath, you know, one of the boats, and they were getting seasick at the entrance of the harbor of Hong Kong. They decided to open the hatch, and in that moment, the boat flips over, and everybody gets trapped, because you know the deal, you gotta go down to get out. And if you can't swim, you're not gonna go down. You were trying to get out. So they got thrown off the boat, so from my understanding, only a few people survived, and two of them were my mom and my oldest brother. So they find some of the friends that were in Hong Kong, and uh, they basically said, well, you gotta get some money because what are you gonna do when you get to Brazil? You can't show up empty-handed. So this is in the days prior to all the internet stuff, right? So the things in Brazil that were in demand were literally dried shrimp, dried seaweed, uh, canned bamboo, you name it, that was used in Asian cuisine, it was all imported from Hong Kong. There was nobody in Brazil that knew what the hell to do with bamboo, right? Or seaweed and all the other, you know. So my mom literally filled an entire container with I don't know how much money it was worth, but she borrowed and basically from everybody she met and knew my dad and basically got on a boat to Brazil with a 10-year-old son to a country she's never seen and basically only speaking Chinese. So she, again, think about this, right? Arriving in Santos, the inspector opens this thing, goes, well, you gotta pay taxes on all this stuff because this is more than a briefcase, right? It's a container. And my mom basically said, I got no money in whatever Chinese you could muster up and says, it's all yours. And the guy goes, I don't know what's in here. You can have it. <laughs> so my mom was able to gather all her stuff get into Sao Paulo, sell all of it to all the different restaurants and everybody that she could find that needed the products, right? Got enough money to pay off all the debt and whatever she needed to pay off. And again, timing, right? My dad was basically having a falling out with his business partner. My mom said, I got some money. Maybe we should kind of maybe get back together, right? Because you, you're the only one of all your friends that didn't remarry somebody along the way, right? And so that's where between the first brother and the second, there's a 10 year gap. So it worked. But by this time, trying to open another Chinese restaurant in Sao Paulo wasn't gonna work because there was a little Chinatown already going. So they decided, you know, in business, you know, have going to call a monopoly. So they go to the other end of the state, right? So Sao Paulo is here near the West East Coast, right? They're literally as, about as far as inland as they can to the other. It's literally about an, an hour uh, of the border for the next state, right? So it's about from here to Arizona, I call it, right? So that's where I grew up. So all my friends basically were Japanese farmers and whatever they did, coffee, cows, that's what I saw. So people say, well, look at you now, you know, surfer. I'm like, I only saw the beach twice in Brazil when I was a kid, right? And that was for a baseball tournament because we were the farmers, right? I lived in, in the restaurant, but all my friends in high school and junior high at the time, you know, were farmers. So we were the best little league baseball team in all of Brazil. So we, I have two medals that still, I you know my parents have it in their, you know, home, that we were the little league champions of Brazil when I was a kid, right? So again, most people go, well, what did you do as a kid? Well, I played baseball. Probably the most unpopular sport in Brazil. So, 
Fast forward, there's three of us now. Uh, my dad, you know, in 19, I think 66, gets the itch again. And this time he goes, there's an opportunity in America. So he decides to come out, venture to Anaheim. And along the way, uh, my oldest brother then, who's going to school, which is now Vanguard University, decides to drop one of the classmates off. And I have no idea how anybody that was going to Vanguard lives on Balbo Island. I, that I'll never know how it happened. But he ended up on Main Street, and there was a Mexican restaurant there called Ola Mendes for sale, right? And out of nowhere, we get a phone call in, Bra in Brazil, and he goes, hey, your dad's going to open a restaurant, and if everything works, we're moving to America. We're still in Brazil, like, yeah, like, that's ever going to happen, right? Sure enough, a couple of years go by, they get the money, Ola Mendes decides to cut a deal with my dad and says, we'll sell you the building for $100,000 on Main Street. Think about that, right? And I'm like, okay, right? So the business opens, and it's putt-putting along. And this is that moment in time because it always happens to any business. It's that golden, you know, lightning strikes, and you got to get it, right? Well, there was a gentleman that lived in one of the other islands named John Wayne. So in my business, I always tell people it's the John Wayne theory, right? So this is the version that all of you guys know. And I'll tell you guys now what really happened. So the version that everybody knew and still knows for about 45 years, the urban myth legend, right, is that John Wayne held his birthday party at my dad's restaurant. And my dad sang happy birthday to John Wayne, right? Most of you guys probably, that's the version you guys all know. And because right after it happened, a picture of John Wayne, you know, signed by him with the menu, and my dad, who didn't have the beer then, right, was put up on the, by the cash register, and the restaurant went from being 20 to 30% occupied to an hour to two hour wait to get in, right? And now think about it. This is Newport Beach, Chinese food. Really? Right? And we're in Brazil like, oh, yeah, your dad is friends with John Wayne. That's what we're hearing. And we're like, okay, right? So all of a sudden, business is booming. It went from literally making nickels to where they can't keep the place staffed enough, right? And it was busy, right? So this, by this time, is 1975, so we all came. And this is the other part of the story. Why I am Lamb and the rest of the family is Lee. Somebody in immigration changed my father's name from Lee to Lamb. So all of us had to change to, from Lee to Lamb to come to America to be part of the same family. As soon as we all got here, everybody went back to Lee. But I joined the fraternity in college, and I was a Lambda Chi. So everybody knew me as Wing Lambda Chi, so I couldn't do it. So, I've always, so I'm the only Lamb left other than my son, right? So things are moving along, right? And because 1975, but here's where the culture shock came, right? It's... None of us kids spoke any English, right? And my mom had this crazy idea that people around Balbo Island, in bathing suits, I call it, right, were walking around as, in her view, as naked, right? So she didn't want to buy a house in Balbo Island. And this is part of why I wish we did. But we did buy the building that we're in, right? But we bought a house in Costa Mesa. And I think one of my f neighborhood friends from Park Vista at the end of 19th Street is here tonight, right? So that's where we moved to. So that's kind of like where each brother, I went to Estancia High School. My other brother, by the time I was getting ready to get graduate, my mom, we bought a house near Newport Harbor. So my other brother went to Newport Harbor. By the time he graduated, my mom goes, there's only one driver left, right? Because my mom doesn't drive. So she finally, in 1980, bought a house on the island. So that's where they've been on Amethyst ever since. So my little brother went to CDM. So we all went to three of the different Newport Mesas. So what happened with John Wayne? So here's the real story. There's a wonderful social columnist that I think she works for Orange Coast or Coast Magazine called Gloria Zigner. You guys have all seen it, a little red hair. So there was a picture. There are two pictures that we remember that got sent to us in Brazil. One is my dad and John Wayne, and one is another with, my, with this redheaded right, because she was much younger in 1970, and her husband then, right? And we never knew who she was all these years. So about 10 years ago, my brother Ed got asked to be in one of the magazines. 
And in the photo shoot process, she shows up and starts talking to my brother. And in the conversation, she asked my brother, goes, you don't know who I am, do you? He goes, my, no idea, right? Because we're looking at her, because we see you at all the charity events, but we have no idea who you are, other than you're a publicist, you do PR, and you have some clients. She goes, well, do you remember that picture from 1970 with your dad and John Wayne? He goes, yeah, we, we all know that. He goes, do you remember the other picture? And for 30 some years, was, we always wonder who the other people were. He goes, that was me. And he goes, now let me tell you what really happened. Right? That's how we found out. So Gloria went on to tell us that at the time, her biggest client was John Wayne's wife, not John Wayne. And the birthday was actually for her then husband. So she had asked her client to say, hey, do you think you can get your husband to come down and wish my husband happy birthday? So he did. He walked through the kitchen, <laughs> wished everybody happy birthday, whatever the husband, right? But the picture that got posted was of John Wayne and my dad. So every, nobody ever asked whose birthday it really was. <laughs> they just assumed it was John Wayne. <laughs> and that's, yeah, Pilar's client, yeah. So for all these years, we always assumed that my dad sang happy birthday to John Wayne. So why did the restaurant get so busy? Well, well, you get to hear the, 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 my dad's only two songs that I know he knows how to sing, which are the same songs he sang then and still does now, right? So customers would come in, and at the time, there was only one round table with the Lady Susan in the corner before we remodeled. So anybody that was anybody would want to reserve that table, preferably on a Friday or Saturday night. I don't know why, because you wanted to be seen by all the other people that were waiting in line and sitting at all the smaller tables. Because in the middle of the dinner, packed house, my dad would come out of the kitchen with a top hat, holding a mug of hot water, basically clear his throat up and sing this happy birthday song, which I know it's not happy birthday, but it's the only song my dad knows how to sing in Chinese. And it's an opera song. And people would be like, you see, I am just as famous as John Wayne, <laughs> right? Because my dad sang to, to John Wayne. And forever, that thing, that was the myth. And that was the story that everybody went with, right? So in the, you know, in the story is my dad ended up sending us all to college, all, the, the, all of it, right? And he never wanted us to be in the business because he goes, dude, it's a lot of hard work. It's a lot of labor. It's a lot of long hours. And you don't realize that Chinese restaurants pretty much never close. And I never knew that because I was away at school. I would be weekends. I go on road trips with my buddies, whatever, right? So against all of their wishes, we started Wahoos, right? And, you know, and, uh, you know, and along the way, my dad opened other restaurants in Costa Mesa, San Diego, whatever, right? But it was never quite the same as the original one on Balboa Island. And some of you guys that lived on the peninsula, uh, for a brief moment in the 80s, there was a restaurant called, actually, uh, yeah, mid-70s called, the uh, 80s uh, called uh, the Seaview Garden, where basically the fire station is right now. So they own that as well. It never really did that well. Hang Chow in Costa Mesa actually did okay. But at the end, we, they ended up donating into the soup kitchen. So the soup kitchen got an amazing deal where they financed their whole, basically, equipment, everything at basically almost 0%, right? So that's how the soup kitchen still. And there's pictures of my mom and dad still somewhere in the restaurant of the soup kitchen, right? So in 1988, I think Bush Sr. was getting elected. We're about to get into a minor recession. And here, me and my two little brothers like, hey, I think this is what we're going to do. And my parents looked at it and goes, I didn't send all of you guys to college to do this, right? So I'm pretty sure we're one of the few or the first college graduates, not culinary degree. So none of us actually know how to really cook, cook, <laughs> other than we know how to do it by seeing it, right? But none of us have a degree in it. And I joke about it because why do you make tacos? You go, well, that's pretty much what I can make, right? <laughs> but we make pretty good ones, right? Because we kind of know what people like to eat. So. All I thought about is if I'm going to do this thing, right, I can find my John Wayne, right? Because that's how my dad did it. So if I can find one John Wayne, this is going to work. So literally, you know, we were like putting along and just kind of like, okay, this is kind of like silly, you know. It's, it's not that busy, right? Kind of like the same process that my dad went through, right? And I literally worked 12, 14 hours every day. I, for the first year and a half, I took, I think, Christmas 
and Easter off, right? I work seven days a week, open to close. Because my mom goes, hey, if you're not making it, you know, you can't take a paycheck until you're making money, right? So I was there making it. So about six months into the whole process, right, I thought, okay, if I could just get that one guy, right, my little John Wayne, this is going to work. Well, there was an event that now is the U.S. Open of Surfing. It used to be called the OP Pro, right? It's a big surf event. It's probably, at the, the U.S. Open is now still the largest by attendance in the world, right? And I thought, if I can maybe get a surfer to come in here, maybe endorse us, maybe this is going to work. And at the time, the best surfer in Orange County that was on the world tour was a kid from Costa Mesa called Richie Collins. And Wave Tools was his dad, Lance Collins. He was literally a block away from me. I'm like, well, one, I don't have the money to go buy a photo from this guy. Because you got to buy the photo, then you got to pay the writer to do all this, right? Well, luckily, across the street from me, there was Billabong. And I became friends with those guys, right? And it was just really funny. The guy at the time who was the manager was a guy named Mike Lesher. He was my little brother's boss back in the Newport Surf and Sport days. And he kept firing my brother. And on Monday, my brother kept showing back up because somebody would rehire him, right? And luckily, Mike doesn't remember firing my kid brother all the time. So I went up to Mike, and Mike, I got this crazy idea, right? I want to run an ad featuring a local surfer, and we want to be like the restaurant that he goes to. And Mike looks at me and goes, what do you want to do? I'm like, okay, so what do you need? I goes, I need a photo. He goes, okay. So he gives me a bunch of photos that they bought, that they paid for, and they own the rights. I'm like, okay, that's the one I want. Because you can see Richard Collins going up a wave, and there's the big Billabong logo. And that's the photo I want to use. And then underneath, we're going to take another picture of just a bunch of us working at the restaurant with the Wahoo sign behind it to show that this is the guy, right? This is our guy, right? And I said, well, can we use your logo, right, Billabong? And they're like, well, well, yeah, but why don't you want to say that you're our official restaurant? And I'm like, you're kidding, right? I, Billabong at the time was the number two brand in the world behind Quicksilver. And you can be your official restaurant. I'm like, I kind of like that, right? This is kind of beginning to feel like John Wayne to me, right? <laughs> so I couldn't just be happy with one logo because there were about six other big surf companies that were all coming into the restaurant. So I pick up the phone and I call my buddy Danny Kwok, who was the head of marketing for Quicksilver at the time. He goes, hey, Danny, uh, we're going to do this scene with Richie for the US, uh, for the OP Pro program, blah, 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 and we're going to be Billabong's official restaurant. Like, uh, I, you know, you can't leave us out as well. So can we be, you know, the other restaurant? I'm like, sure. <laughs> so then I call my buddy at Stussy, who at the time was another big brand, right? And I'm like, hey, we're going to be Billabong's and Quicksilver. What do you think they said, right? So the first time we ever ran the scene, I had six logos on that. We were their official restaurant to what I call four of the biggest brand in the world, in the surfing community, right? All of a sudden, the kids in the house are like, this is Billabong's official restaurant. We got to go check it out, right? So the ball starts getting momentum. Well, the next thing that happens is when pro surfers come into town to visit their sponsor, they go on what they would call it a walkthrough, right? To get their swag, right? Their t-shirts, hats, whatever, right? And I got to be friends with the team managers of all the four big companies. And I said, hey, by the way, you know, I know you're giving us stuff, right, to wear, because we, back then we didn't wear anything that said Wahoo's on it. We just wore whatever was available from the surf industry. So in exchange, when they come in, just bring them by the restaurant, right? And we'll just barter food for tacos, and it'll be awesome. And you guys got T-shirts, right? So at the time, I knew that there's this kid named Tom Curran, who's a three-time World Surf champion. He walks in the door, right? And right behind him, there's a, another kid from Australia named Mark Acalupo, right? And behind him, there's another guy from England called Todd Martin, right? All of a sudden, I have, and there, there was Barton Lynch, right? All of a sudden, I have four world champions in my restaurant. And the kids are like, oh, my God, this is crazy. There are real John Waynes eating here, unlike his John Wayne that actually just showed up, right? They're actually sitting down and eating, right? And we have this ball rolling. So I'm like, okay, not everybody here cares about surfers, right? What else is out there, right? Well, guess what happens, right? When kids are not surfing because either the waters are dirty or it's flat, 
They're skateboarding. Right? And there's another kid that I met in the early 90s called Tony Hawk. Right? And guess what happened in the 80s? All the skate parks in California got shut down because of the liability. Somewhere in the early 90s, they changed the law to say you're an idiot if you fall down and break your arm. We're not responsible. The same liability wavered on the back of a ski ticket. They figured that out. And they're like, aha. So now all of a sudden, Tony's kind of cruising. I'm like, hey, I'm the guy, right? So I got Tony. Then when it's in the winter, there's another sport that started in the 90s called snowboarding. So I get up there, I do a couple of events, and I meet a little six-year-old named Sean White. Right? Pretty much gave him his first free meal ever, right? And I can just tell you, so now I got surf, I got skate, and I got snow, right? And guess what happens? Surf, all the what they call it action sports brands, the way they promote themselves is through videos, right? There's a surf video, a skate video, whatever, right? And guess what? If you just watch surfing or skateboarding without soundtrack, it's boring. So they match music to it, right? And who do they get? Basically bands that are starting up, right? The Offsprings, the Green Days, the Blink-182s of the world, right? Guess again who's partnering with those guys? Because one, it was the only thing I could afford, right? And I had hundreds of bands that never made it, but I only needed one, right? Because I probably fed to date, I don't even know how many hundreds of thousands of every one of those sports, but I only needed one Kelly Slater to become world champion. So if you want a world title of almost any of these sports, right? I was there when you're an amateur. I was there when nobody gave anything but a sticker to you, right? I was the guy that came to all the events, whether it was in the mountains, a skate park, or in the beaches, backstage, just about any concert, right? So now all of a sudden I got quite a few John Waynes, right? And things are moving along, right? And then the ultimate, which is, I think it's hilarious. We 13 years in business, 13 stores, not bad, right? But in 2000, a company called Merrill Lynch decides that they want to have small businesses in their commercials, kind of what you see in American Express, right? Send down 650 clients reply, we were one of them. Gets down to about three dozen. They call my brother and goes, Ed, I don't get it. What's the big deal? So you're making tacos, right? And my brother literally, without knowing their tagline, which was the American dream, basically said, hey, but where else in the world can a Chinese guy sell Mexican food? <laughs> and the guy goes, what? He goes, look at the pictures. And there he sees three Asian kids. This is the American dream. You can do anything in America you want, right? So we get picked. Six companies get featured, right? And the story, I can't make it up. At the time, it airs for the first time. It's in the wild card playoff game of the NFL. First weekend in January. We're at an event in Palm Springs with all these baseball players as a Pepsi All-Star, whatever, right? And there is a guy named Peter Waller, who was then at the time the CEO of Taco Bell. He walks up to me and goes, dude, you just stole my line. And I'm like, okay, I don't even know who you are, but okay. He goes, I used to be able to tell everybody only in America can a British guy sell Mexican food. He was British. And now you just got it. And I'm like, what? Because I just saw your commercial. And all the players that were out there, Mike Piazza, all these guys go, dude, I just saw you on TV. I'm like, what are you talking about? And basically for the next year, see Final Four, uh, National Hockey, every sporting event for a whole year featured our commercial because they tested the six commercials that they filmed but ours was the best, they got the best response, right? So we're in print magazines, every direct mail piece that Merrill Lynch sent, about a $60 million marketing boost. And the coolest part is, my mom and dad are in the background of the commercial making dumplings. They each got paid about 20,000 bucks to do it. Because back then, right, you gotta have a SAG card, da da da, right? Even better, right, on their side of the commercial was about eight years later, Visa did a commercial series called Visa Takes Life. And it was featured in the uh, Italian Olympics. And in it, there was snippets of different people doing different things. And the same production company that did our commercial did that. They called my brother and goes, 
how'd you like to be in it again doing what? He goes, just have your parents making dumplings again. So if you can find both of the commercials, the scene is almost identical. It's my dad rolling dumplings and my brother walking behind him. So my dad gets another 20 grand for doing the same thing, not speaking anything in the commercial. Right? So from 2000, you fast forward for the next 13 years, we basically went from 13 stores to about 50 stores. Right? Because all of a sudden we had this huge, you know, I call it John Wayne boost. Right? It was unbelievable. The ride has been great. And here's where we kind of like along the way, what have we learned, right? If we were ever going to sell, that was the time to sell it. But guess what? You know, having met enough what I call professional guys from different sports, music, and all that, one of the things they always regret, at least the athletes, is the day they walked off the field because everything went with it. You didn't become another person, right? And I'm like, what are you talking about, right? And then a few years back, uh, my buddy Tim Salmon retired, right? And here he was playing, what, 15 some years in the majors, whatever. Literally the day he retired, but he's still an announcer for the Angels. You should see, and it's like completely when he was playing, the people that came to him, and now it's like he's just another person. And I'm like, that is insanity. You're still the same Tim Salmon that I've known all these years, right? But he goes, just people now prefer another fish called trout. <laughs> <laughs> That's the reality of it, right? You're yesterday's news. I'm really sorry, right? So think about it, because in our neighborhood, there are a couple of the brothers that, that played in the, uh, the Niedermeyer brothers, right? If you see them, I guarantee none of you guys even think twice who they are. But here they are, was MVP of the Stanley Cup, the final, uh, the, the Olympic team for Canada, all this. And yet, they're just another resident of Newport Beach, right? So that's what happened. So I'm like, hmm. And then I went to another concert, and I got to see the Rolling Stones in their 70s. I'm like, you know what? I kind of like that much better, you know? Here's a bunch of 18-year-olds screaming at these seven-year-old guys. I don't know, but I don't see them doing to Tim, but they see, I see them doing to Mick Jagger, right? So the idea, you know, is like, hey, we don't need to be the biggest. We don't need to be that. We just got to have fun while we're doing it. So that's what kind of motivates us. Yes, it would be nicer to have all the extra money, all that. Don't get me wrong, but at the same time, money can't buy that, right? And that's ultimately what I saw. So all the years, I'm saying, right, you know, this is amazing. Right? that we've been able to now be in business almost 30 years. Starting in 2018, it'll be our 30th year of WOWS. My parents' restaurant have been around since 1970. They've been through numerous renditions of different chefs, different owners, but luckily for me, my parents have never sold the little property that it sits on, right? And I can't think of that many businesses that have been around that long, right? But then every now and again, I'll get a chance to meet, you know, the guys that started the crab cooker, and just to sit there and go, like, wow, and you've been doing this for 50-some years, right? And I met a couple of the guys over the weekend that cask and cleaver. I'm like, oh, my God, that's like from the 60s, right? I don't even know there are any around. Well, guess what? There's about three of them around still, right? But this is, you know, it's still here. And why do they do it? Because these guys are 70, 80 years old because they love it. So when I see that, I'm like, hmm, I think I can hang. And now that I have a little one again, right, I kind of like, you know what? I like to be around to, to see him you know, see all the things that I've done, right? And my brothers, I mean, yes, we're, we hate each other, we love each other, but, you know, I wouldn't have it any other way, right? I know that I can always count on them to be there for me, right? So I do what I can, they do what they can. Sometimes we all think that the other guy is goofing around too much, but that's brothers, right? And we have a lot of fun with it. So that's, you know, the story, you know, and I'm glad that my parents still live on the island, they travel, they're still here, and I think, at some point, my dad is going to go, okay, I need to wake everybody up. And I think my dad is going to do something that probably, I don't know how many of you guys have ever seen him sing, right? But I know that Shirley got a, a quick one at the museum, and it was pretty good. So with that, you know the title. Tug of the Gut. Yeah. Can you tell them? Tug of the Gut. Yeah, tell them. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Hao 
，泪湿相思带，今宵离别恨，花儿寻再来，何问了这杯清静的小菜，人生难得。几回转，一、哎、不喝刚个蛋。来来来，喝完了这杯再说吧。哦，有一天在那街上遇见你。有些过去和你早无所亲意，你仿佛有一道皮，两只眼睛望着地。我是最喜欢你，我想要认识你，我俩做朋友没关系，谁知道你觉得了？不惜，好像是让再有你，我愿意为你把头低，那是因为我爱你 ，I love you。哈哈哈哈哈哈哈 My dad loves embarrassing my mom still. So those are the two songs that my dad knows ever since I can remember him singing, right? And I can guarantee you, neither one is a happy birthday song. <laughs> so I don't know if anybody has any questions, but I do want to tell one story though, because the, the 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 other urban myth, right, that my dad or my mom used to get the ducks from the bay. You guys have all heard it. <laughs> so let me tell you the real story here, okay? And I don't know if they still make it, right? But back in the day, there was a dish, an appetizer called、uh, shrimp toast, right?、Yes. It was basically wonder white bread that they would grind、uh, fresh shrimp, put it on top, right, and deep fry it, and then cut it into diamonds. Okay. So, but my somebody, I don't know where it, it came from, but nobody liked the edge of the bread, so they cut the edges of the bread, and they would have bags of this bread. And my mom said, "Well, let's not waste, right? Very frugal." So she would walk to the canal, and basically take the bag and give it to the ducks. Somebody saw that, <laughs> then saw a picking duck hanging, <laughs> right, and assumed. And I'm like, and I can tell you that my mom couldn't hurt a fly, because you know the Buddhist and the whole thing, right? Because my mom used to yell at me. Once a month, when I used to go scuba diving with my buddy Mike, who's here somewhere, right? Where are you? There is Mike, my oldest friend in America, Mr. Mike Villani here, my scuba diving instructor. <laughs> so I would come home on Sundays, and my mom goes, "What in the world is that on the side of the fish?" I'm like, "Well, how do you think you spear fish a fish? You got to shoot it." He goes, "No, you can't do that." He goes, "What's the difference between spearing and catching them on a hook?" Well, if the fish is dumb enough. To eat the worm, then he deserves it, but you can't shoot him, right? So that's why I'm like, so my mom would never go out there and try to trap whatever the duck, right? Because one, you don't even know where these ducks come from, right? But yeah, so that was that was the legend. And every now and then, somebody will ask me, "Was did your mom actually do anything with the ducks from the bay?" I'm like, no, never. <laughs> They came prepackaged, clean, defeathered, the whole nine yards from a supplier. So does anybody have any? Yes, ma'am.、Uh, the first Wahoos was over on Placentia Avenue on the corner of Center Street and Placentia between 18th and 19th, because that's where all the surf companies then were based, and there's a few left still. Yes. Well, <laughs> the, the, the real story is because I spend so much time 
in the original like five stores. I mean, I was there pretty much every day in one of them, right? And I always remember what, like you, you always hear from your friends that work somewhere, how their bosses are a big whatever, right? And I'm like, I never want to be that, right? So I always, you know, the tough love, don't let them get away with murder, but at the same time, I really took care of my employees. So they tended to hire their friends to say, hey, this is a really fun place to work, right? So the original crew is all around still, but the most important thing is my art director, he's been with me for 15 years, but more important, his mom has been with me for like 20 some years, right? So I have second generation kids that are working for us now. And that to me, so I have a saying about the whole thing is, and that's, I think, I wish more people would translate because if you're working with Hispanics, right? There's a saying that they use is mi casa is su casa, right? What does that mean, right? Well, I tell them, because your place of work is your house because this is where you spend eight hours a day or whatever, right? So imagine the customer is not being somebody who's spending money, but it's somebody that's coming to visit you. How would you treat them? If somebody was coming to your house, how would you be a good host? And they go, I got it. And you don't have to explain what that means because you guys all know what a good host is and you guys all know what a bad host is. A guy or a girl whose house you have to bring your own food, bring your own drinks because you never know what they're going to be serving. <laughs> and more important, they never ask you if you need anything. So think about that, right? And they'll look at me and go, no need to explain anymore, right? So between taking care of them on one side and really showing them how out of the way I go for my customers and all that, they're like, we can do that. And better than that, when you're gone, we're gonna do it better than you, right? So I think it's hilarious that some of my store managers, customers will bring them like Christmas gifts because they all know each other by first name, right? And it's that's, I think if more business did that, right, and not look at it as another transaction, right? I think everybody would do better. Hi. Okay, Wahoos is another funny story. So we were racking our brains trying to come up with a name. You guys all know another famous restaurateur in town named Alan Greeley, the Golden Truffle. So Alan Greeley's little brother, Mark, and I were classmates. So Mark's cousin, Gary, used to come in and hang out with us. And one day, literally, I think it was two weeks before we opened, and he literally says, I'm having a Wahoo's fish taco party at my house. I just got back from fishing. And I said, you're going to have a Hawaiian-themed party. Because I thought he said Oahu as in the island. I had never heard the word Wahoo's as referred to a fish, because in Hawaii they call it Ono. And that was one of the names we were going to do it, until somebody says, but what if somebody says, you're going to go to O knows? And I'm like, oh, that's not what we want. We want him to go to O knows. But back then, nobody could say it. When he said the word Wahoo, I'm like, and it's the best fish. We want to be the best fish taco. That's what we're going to call it. And I go, Gary, guess what? It's going to be called Wahoo's Fish Taco. And he says, ah, ha, ha, ha. And I'm like, two weeks later, it opened as Wahoo's Fish Tacos. Well, we keep laughing about it because we don't own the property, right? But it's just one of those where it's, then we wouldn't have a Chinese restaurant around, right? So part of us was, we want to do it. And part of me was, well, then I got to go all the way to wherever to have Chinese food. And I still love eating Chinese food. So that's, yeah. <laughs> so for as long as the people want to run it, we're going to let it be. And then, uh, and again, and Here's like another thing for all of us that have been around here. How nice is it that when you bought a house for, let's say, 100000 on the island, not $10 million, whatever, right? Your mortgage is about this size, right? So my parents have allowed every person that's been a tenant of ours to get that break as though the business was worth about 100000 right? So literally, they pay a fraction of what the market rate is. And that's why... If you look at the prices at the restaurant, why are they charging you only 12 bucks or whatever, right? For every other restaurant is charging you 25. Well, because they don't have to pay this huge amount of rent. So if more people did that, it would allow for all of us because the saving gets passed on to us, right? And I would say the opposite. We have a crazy landlord in 
one of the cities in, up in LA, he's a third generation that they've owned that building since the 40s. You don't need to charge me $10 a square foot. Trust me. If you charge me a nickel, you'd still be making money because that building's been paid for 100 years ago, right? But this guy believes that goes, hey, that's what the market rate is, and guess what? There's really no other choice for you. If you want to stay here, this is what you're going to have to pay. And I can tell you some of the shopping centers around here feel the same way, right? And that's what we all pay for, you know? So again, it, I, I don't need to know who they are, but you guys know who all the big landlords are. But again, I mean, you want to make a return on your money, but we end up paying for that return on the money. <laughs> the, the funny part is, around here, I like the nostalgic places, like literally because I live down on the peninsula, the crab cooker is always, you know, a favorite of mine. Charlie's Chili has been there for a million years, you know. Uh, Woody's, you know, awesome on the water there. Uh, more recent, you know, you got Blue Water Grill, the cannery. Because I tend to, you know, Amama D's, all the restaurants that I can, quote, unquote, walk to, I don't have to Uber to, I enjoy. And then I love the fact that when they reopen A, which used to be the Arches, they do an amazing job there, the winery. So there's some really good restaurants I call local. And then I drag my buddy from West Covina all the way out here. Rick back there, uh, he will be one of 120 competitors in Taco Landia's uh, event in LA in next month. So he's the original, I call it gangster, but you know we've been hanging out lately. And, uh, and it's funny because I've never met, and, and I can joke about it because we can call each other names, a guy, a Mexican guy who enjoys wines. Because most of them, all my employees just drink beer for 30 years. And he and I said, we enjoy wine. He goes, well, come on down. Let's drink some wines. And it's because of his actual you know, chef training and whatnot. But we've been having fun. And we did a little dinner on Sunday night where he made some amazing tacos. And I said, well, you got to check out my stuff too, right? And we've been having fun. So uh, at Taco Landia, uh, we got to make sure that nobody realizes that we're friends because he's a competitor and I'll be one of the judges. <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, Michael? This is where I think it's going right now is more and more people want to know who and where their food is make, coming from, right? So the whole trend up until I call it the Chipotle debauchery, right, where everybody got sick because they used a central commissary that maybe wasn't properly, you know, the handling of the food, right? So the idea is the good thing about a commissary is you can uh, basically streamline the operation and you have consistent product. The downside to that is that stuff is going to go to 50 stores. So if you got one bad batch or whatever, a lot of people are going to get affected by it, right? So with us, we remain true to my dad's original recipes where we're going to make everything from scratch in every restaurant. You won't find a restaurant that's bigger than five that doesn't use some kind of a central deal because it's just the labor is crazy, especially now the minimum wage is going to go to 15, right? So where we are now, we're talking to people about how did you do it for 30 years? And you don't cheat. That's basically, using a commissary is like going to the grocery store and buying a ready-to-eat meal, right? Because somebody made it, but we don't know who and where. Well, Whole Foods and all of these places are now you know, banking on the fact that you want to know that it was made here by somebody that you know, right? And so you know, we love and you hate Whole Foods, but they basically created this whole market where you know, locally, organic, you know, non-GMO, all the stuff is important. And as we age, Basically, a lot of the stuff that's affecting us is based on what we ate, at, you know, through our lives, right? Because you can't exercise every day like you were when you were 18 years old. So the diet is becomes a major issue, right? So to us is we're basically poised to just keep doing what we've been doing. We don't have to reinvent ourselves, right? Because everybody's trying to do what we're doing. So a lot of the guys that are claiming locally, Yes, at one point it was locally before you shipped it to that commissary 300 miles away from here, right? So that's really the big thing right now. And I think one of the nice restaurants here, somebody wrote a nice piece about them that they were paying X for a, uh, what was the dish that it was? It was a risotto that was made in New York. And it was basically flash frozen, whatever, and then they shipped it and then they just reheated it here, right? And it was all over because once people find out, it goes, oh, my God. I mean, that's basically frozen dinner. And why am I paying $30 for this, you know, truffle, whatever, risotto? You didn't make it right here, right? I could have done that at home for about five bucks, right? 
So we want you to come because we are making fresh food, right? And I think more and more everybody wants that. So, and you're finding out that a lot of guys, and I know all of them, that are claiming that, that are bigger than about five units, I'm like, no, you're not, right? And if you're claiming the other big loophole that all you guys need to pay attention to is the key word, how everybody gets around the loopholes is when available. That's like saying any of the diet things at the very end of the commercial says results may vary, right? Which means that if you eat one more calorie than they're starving you to death, we're not responsible. So the word weighing available is there's 365 days a year. If one day a year they bring an organic tomato in, they can make that claim. Now think about it for a second, right? If you're not paying $10 for a taco, I guarantee you it's not locally sourced because an organic tomato local is X, right? It's about $3 per. I can buy 25 pounds for five bucks to mash them. Think about the math. It's not possible to do what they're claiming they're doing. And if they throw in a local cilantro, which is the cheapest item on the menu, they fulfill their requirement because they put the word local at the top of all the ingredients. Only one of them has to be, and only has to be one day a year. <laughs> tomorrow, where am I gonna be tomorrow? Where is tomorrow's Wednesday? I, I might be in LA, I'm, I'm trying to hunt. I, and I was sharing with somebody earlier. This is crazy, because you know, here is my mom and dad. Again, forever, we're the only Chinese family around, right? So I come to find out, while helping another friend of mine, making a documentary that she's been working on for seven years about the music, first music editor of Rolling Stone magazine. But the way she said the name, she always said Ben Fontori. I thought it was an Italian guy. The middle name that you never hear is Fong, F-O-N-G. Chinese guy, right? The most powerful guy in music for the first 50 years of Rolling Stone magazine is a Chinese guy from San Francisco. The Tory comes from, they, they stole some paperwork in the Philippines, right? To come to America. So tomorrow is the last shoot, and they're doing it with Cameron Crowe, who wrote uh, Almost Famous. So if I don't make it, I got it so that they're using my truck to pick him up. <laughs> so my truck may make the final cut. And then over the weekend, at one of our other events that Rick and I were at, was the biggest wine guy in America, who basically was the head buyer for BevMo for, I don't know, 20 or 30 years, right? Who has tasted and scored more wines than anybody in America, right? Hundreds and hundreds a day, right? His name, Wilfred Wong, <laughs> right? Turns out that Wilfred was neighbors with Ben when they were kids in San Francisco. So I called the director, I'm like, call Wilfred, and get him to be in the shoot on Sunday. And she just sent me the pictures. He made, the, he made it because they were both in San Francisco over the weekend. And they reconnected, they were basically, they were friends since they were kids. So here are two Chinese, so think about it, right? Wine and Chinese guy, music and another Chinese guy. I mean, it's, it's, to me it's funny. And here are my parents, you know, in a museum on Bumble Island, and I'm like, okay, you know. So thank you guys.